right, so welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is Lecture 7, Mashups. Uh, before we dive in, though, I thought we would bring our big board to a conclusion. These, as of close of market on Friday, were our top five. Um, Ozzy seems to have done eight worth of his success here. Having started, of course, with just 10K, um, now I'd be remiss if I didn't also show the bottom of the list, particularly since I'm on it. Um, the bottom four has been down 17%, not as bad as Robert. So uh, I was actually down there at 87 for a few days. But fortunately, I redeemed myself somewhat. Uh, but those were the results of the big boars. We hope you uh, enjoyed playing along, or at least testing, when we first debuted that. A quick word on project two which just came in. Um, this is the same heuristics and gra uh, grading metrics that we showed you for project one, so just know to expect that same thing as taking the time to color code it to emphasize per a post on the bulletin board that scores, at least on the first of these projects, projects one of good or three, um, are to be expected and are in fact good. Do not assume that this distribution implies uh, E, D, C, B, A. It implies poor, fair, good, better, best. And we'll elaborate certainly in comments on, on the feedback we provide. Uh, all right, so let's motivate tonight's discussion by looking at a technology that's dear to me and I know some of the teaching fellows. Let me see if we got some audio here. So this is a minute or so demo of the Nintendo Wii News Channel. Too much. So all of this, if you've never seen it, this interactivity of this hand is actually being done by someone holding uh, an accelerometer, an RF-based thing in a moment. But I actually think that's the neatest feature of this thing. thing is I wish I could have found happier news. Okay, so this is the part to focus on. The fellow just clicked globe and what you're seeing is a globe zooming in and out. You can start to make out the eastern coast of the US. Now we're spinning and clicking and dragging the world over to Europe. And notice that each of these icons represents a stack of news articles from the area. Clicking on those actually yields what the article is. And so We'll actually zoom out quite a bit in a moment and you'll see the 3D aspect of this. Notice how much news is in, I guess, Washington. And at the end of the day, all the news channel does for you is deliver the news. Um, but frankly, it's these, these UI enhancements that actually just make this really neat, to say the least. And so, uh, having spent myself all too much time I'm using the Nintendo Wii, though ironically not the news channel, um, we thought we'd use this for inspiration for the last of the courses assigned projects, Project 3. Hey, could you expose the antenna on that body pack? Sure. Yeah. All right. See if that does the trick? Yeah. All right, so it's this that motivated the design of Project 2, context for which is this notion of a mashup, which is more buzzword than anything, but they're increasingly popular. And so let me toss out for tonight's first question, what is a mashup as you understand it? Sort of a silly term that means nothing technically really. But still everybody likes mashups it seems. Sure. Take two technologies, take two data sets and put them together to make something. And I'll admit the first time I heard the word when mine emailed me to say, hey, uh, a friend of mine and I are thinking of making a mashup. What do you think of this idea? And I never heard the term. I thought it was the stupidest thing, like all of these sort of web 2.0. Oh, there's another one, web 2.0 um, buzzwords. But the more I sort of got to appreciate how much data is now publicly available, how many folks like Google in particular had started making as another open source library, it actually really began to strike me as being what the web or what software development on the web really should be all about. Building things out of existing tools, building things out of 
existing data sets and really bringing the fun back to creating because you don't have to architect everything yourself from scratch. So what I thought we'd do for this lecture, even though the broad topic is this notion of mashup, is focus on at least API in particular. That in Google Maps for Project 3, you will also make use of Google News and you'll also make use of that will do you talk about that tonight. Um, but tonight is not meant to be so much about how to use Google's API, but how to view, say, Google's API as representative of the types of APIs and the types of data sets that are out there. And you'll focus specifically on Google's APIs for Project 2. And frankly, I mean, it's very easy to compliment, it seems, Google these days, and they're certainly doing well. At some fake <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so tonight is about exposing some of the principles that underlie these mashups, but really focusing on some of the fun aspects of what you can do and what you will do for this particular project. So let me begin with a quick demo of hopefully a website you've all used before. So Google Maps debuted, I think, a few years ago. And frankly, when it first came out, really blew out of the water Yahoo Maps and MapQuest, which were sort of the de facto standards. And I would argue that one of the, and this is from personal opinion only, I would argue that, frankly, it was UI enhancements like this that actually made Google Maps pretty darn compelling early on. The fact that you could simply click on an area. Of course, our demos always like to blow up when we try them. Um, the fact that there was no more of this click the left arrow to get this arrow to get this one, but that you could actually just start scrolling. And if I actually had a wheel mouse on my computer, these days they even support the third wheel button on most mice so that you can zoom in and you can zoom out. And I think it's probably a very safe bet to say that within just a few months or at least a year or two, what we now know as Google Earth, if you've ever played with it, will be increasingly integrated into Google Maps itself. And you already see Google Sky, I think, is web-based now, so that you can actually look upwards instead of downwards. So I think it's this kind of interactivity and these kinds of UIs that really are probably the future of you know, software, I mean, web-based software. But without going off on a tangent there, this is the interface. Notice that I can type in something like 02138, a zip code, and I can get back the locations on uh, the map representing campus here, and it's all a very fluid interface. So what is the technology or technologies underlying presumably this UI? Ajax, all right? So Ajax is what we talked about um, last week, and one of the technologies or techniques that you'll focus on for Project 3. So what does that really mean? Well, we brought this example up, I think, a few weeks ago. When you click and drag, you'll notice that there's some gray blemishes there. But really. Yeah, so the web page behind the scenes is making another HTTP request or two of Google's server, fetching back some more GIFs or JPEGs, and then inserting those into the div or whatever kind of container this actually is, because at no point does my URL actually ever change. Now, interesting to point out, perhaps, at this point in the discussion, since you know, there's perhaps a price to some of these, uh, these enhancements, is that if I want to say email a friend of mine to meet me in Harvard Square, typically for 10 years I would click the, highlight the URL into an email and voila, where's my friend going to end up when he obviously clicks that link? All right, so it's going to end up at the default page because now with Ajax in particular, there's this issue of maintaining state, which for years sort of had by nature been maintained in the URL. Click a link, you go to a new URL, the, the address bar changes, and so embedded implicitly in that URL was some notion of state, what page you were at, what parameters you just provided, what your username is, any of those kinds of HTTP parameters. Um, so Google has worked around this by, clicking, uh, by providing this feature. So link to this page. So what is that button presumably doing? I mean, it is providing a link, but how did that get generated? What's the explanation behind it? So, yeah, so something, someone is maintaining state. It's probably in the form of And so what that URL is, is probably a concatenation of a bunch of pieces of data that Google's been maintaining as I click and drag, so that all that information's there, but only through this URL is it actually exposed. So this isn't the only way. There's another technique that a few sites are using, but even then, 
it's not a perfect solution depending on the browser you're using. How do other websites that are very Ajaxy, so to speak, maintain state? Step which arguably, at least still right now, is non obvious to most users. There is a trick that some websites use. Facebook has started using it, and then a few others. So for years, there was this sort of a semi-stupid thing that was popular on websites, which was this fragment ID. So you have a URL, and then the sharp sign, and then the name of really an anchor that's somewhere in the page. And the idea behind that, it's not so stupid. It does have value, but it allows the browser to know that it needs to automatically scroll to a certain point in the page. So it was sort of a way, for the most part, of indicating horizontal boundaries that you want the page to automatically go to. Well, what m some websites and some libraries have begun doing is storing and the so-called fragment ID. And we won't focus on this tonight, but just so that you've seen it before, the neat thing with most, if not all, browsers is that typically by changing the fragment ID, you're able to record information effectively, but without reloading the page. Because typically, if you click a link that's just supposed to go to a fragment ID, it only changes you within the page. It doesn't cause a new HTTP transaction. But the upside is that you're more visually storing information in the URL without this added step. Now, the gotcha is that this is not very, requires jumping through some hoops information in that field there. And so there's a lot of tricks if you start Googling around involving iframes on some browsers, certainly using JavaScript in most of the browsers. So re for tonight's purposes, just realize that Ajax does tend to break a lot of sites, um, a lot of and the solutions right now are sort of only partial. And I think it says something if sort of one of the most popular websites in the world or companies in the world is using this workaround still, so to speak. So problem I'm sure that will go away over time, but realize the implications at least for now when you're doing Ajax-like things underneath the hood. All right, so now I really like Google Maps and I want to somehow integrate it into my website because maybe I own a pizza shop and I want to show people on my web page how to get there, but I don't want to just show them a simple square. I want them to be able to, say, zoom out, maybe get directions, all by leveraging someone else's interface. How can I go about implementing a Google Map or integrating a Google Map into my own site? Well, a Google Maps API will lead you to this top link here. All right, and this, this area of Google's website will probably become your friend for the next several weeks. Notice at top right, they're pretty to the point. How do you start using Google's API to create the first of your mashups, integrating maps with something else? Well, you're going to need what's called the Google Maps API key, which is a freely available unique token that gets assigned to you and your domain name. So certainly sign up for that per the spec. And then there's the Maps API's concepts. Maps examples and Maps API reference, all of which will probably be useful to you. Let's go ahead, though, and start with an example that I put together among tonight's handouts called Google1.html. So the goal here was for me to create a website that somehow integrates a Google Map into my own web page. All right, so this is a very simple idea. I really just want to recreate the Google experience. Well, how can I do this? So this is Google1.html. It's for the most part just a bunch of HTML markup up until at least the head element where I have this tag. So the means by which I patch into Google's API, much like I would most any other uh, similar API out there, is to include their JavaScript in my code so that I have access to the functions that those folks have implemented. It's a long looking URL, but it embedded in there is a uh, parameter called key equals, and then that long string is the string that I downloaded as my API key. And this isn't something secret or special, it doesn't matter that it's publicly exposed, it just has to do, I presume, with Google keeping track of who's using their software. And it validates against your domain so that you are forced to use typically your own key, but I suspect it's just for tracking purposes. Now let me fast and show you what the contents of my web page are. Three lines of code. Can I implement a Google Map within my own website's page? So I've got a body element there, inside of which is a div, which I have seemingly coincidentally given an ID of map. Then I've done some stylization, height equals 100%, width equals 100%, because I just want this thing to fill my window and give a full screen Google Map, so to speak. And then the magic really seems to happen in those event handlers. So on load and on unload, the initialize function is called. 
And then the g unload function is called upon the page's unloading. What does it mean to unload a page, incidentally? To just go away, close the window, click to another domain. Um, I'm not sure actually if the latter would do it. It probably should. If you navigate away to another page within the same process, it should call the g unload function, which in our case actually has the effect of freeing some memory and cleaning th some things up, which is a good thing. But this initialize function, I myself wrote. So what does it take to integrate a map into your site? Well, I wrote this JavaScript function called initialize. Takes no arguments, which is fine, because I didn't provide any when I have this thing invoked. And now I'm calling this seemingly globally accessible function now called if G browser is compatible, just returns a Boolean, yay or nay, to try to discourage um, breaking old browsers behavior. And then two lines of code, frankly. So var map gives me a variable called map. I instantiate a new object called gmap2. Uh, and I pass it just one argument. So document .get element by ID map. So you can sort of infer what's going on. So Google's code base that I included via that script tag has a constructor, so to speak, or a function called gmap2 that takes at least one argument, which is ideally a reference to the object in the page, the DOM node, that I want them to go and insert one of their Google Maps into. And remember, that just comes from my specification of this div here, which right now it's completely empty. So they're presumably going to clobber that emptiness with their actual map. And then the only other thing I have to do, if I don't want it to just show the whole world by default, is set the center of the map to be the following point. So in Google Maps, you can provide addresses, as we'll see with an example or two tonight. But typically, Google uh, positions itself by way of latitude and longitude coordinates. So what I'm doing here, and I just did some Googling, or I think I just poked around on Google Maps to figure these out. I decided that this is where Cambridge, Massachusetts would be located. This is its latitude. This is its longitude. And then this second argument here, which comes after this newly instantiated uh, G lat long um, object, is the zoom level. So zero means really zoomed really far out from space, I believe. And then the other direction, it goes up to like, I think 16 or 17 currently, it gets you closer and closer to Earth. So I wanted us to be able to see the streets, so I chose 15 after some trial and error. So let's see what the result is. This is again Google One. Pull up our source code, Google One. And wow, I've just sort of reinvented the wheel, so to speak. But now I can click, I can drag, but unfortunately, what can I not do? can't really do anything else, right? If you're sort of looking closely, there's no search field, right? There's not even a zoom field. There's no options for hybrids or satellites. Like this is really bare bones, but it hints at just the ease with which we can integrate this into one site. And let me try to motivate this now because this is not certainly a compelling demo, but in my Googling, I came across the other day this cute demonstration. So Google Drive. It's something that actually someone put together, I think, with the help of the Moo Tools framework, which is one of the frameworks that we suggested the other day. And this is the coolest, cutest, mostly useless little thing. Um, this is a Google map. I think we're currently based in the UK. Uh, see the little car there? OK, so I'm going to use my keyboard's up, down, left, right keys. Oh, wait, I need to uh, focus on this, it seems. Oh, I think IE is forever uncooperative. Hang on one sec. It was scrolling the whole page, which it should not be. And again, welcome to the world of cross-platform headaches. OK, let's see if it stays here. So there's my little car. There we go. Firefox behaves. So, and notice, I can't drive off the road. So they're presumably doing some kind of recognition of the color or the coordinates. I didn't look closely underneath the hood. Yeah, you can drive backwards. So I don't think that's something the API exposes the directions. And actually, I think I ended up in Harvard Yard by accident, um, presumably because it's using color or something. In fact, let's go to Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02138. OK, so here we are. All right, on Mass Ave. Let's turn around. OK, and there's the common. Oh, here, we, whoa, a busway, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure goes down in reality. But here we are, right? The classroom's right about here. But we can keep going the wrong way on Mass Ave. And I, honestly, I bet at least a third of you go home and play with this at some point. 
but it's really neat. So that's a much better mashup than I already made. So let's see if we can take some baby steps to at least something approaching cool. So let's take a look now at google2.html. And again, you will find innumerable examples on Google's website and just by Googling other people's work. What I tried to do in these several examples for tonight is sort of build things up step by step and sort of highlight what you really need to know so that when you want to start adding some of the neater features or dive in deeper, just know that there's a ridiculous amount of reference material available as well. So this whole setup is pretty much a copy paste from the other file, but I now have some more JavaScript. Okay, and let me take make note of one thing incidentally, because one of the um, perhaps subtle um, but less potentially headache-inducing requirements of the project is for your Google Map not to perfectly fill the window, but to grow to fill the window while still leaving room for a bit of user interface, like a form. Um, it turns out that is non-trivial to do, at least cross uh, browser. So I get away with this first demo with simply. Uh, filling the whole screen. And that's pretty easy, though not as easy as you might think. So at least with one or more browsers, I actually had to go, so I developed just by habit on IE, and then I typically test things on all other browsers. And as soon as I tested tonight's demos on Firefox, they all broke, right? and I saw nothing. And so one of the reasons for that in this earlier demo was that even though I said my div needs to have a height of 100% and a margin, uh, actually of a height of 100%, at least with one browser. I think it's Firefox, and some of you ran into this with a BG color issue several weeks ago. I also had to then go and add height equals 100% to the HTML element and also to the body, which you would like to think are, oh, I was highlighting the wrong one. This height 100% is on the body, and then on the div, I also said 100% as well, essentially compelling the browser to think of the whole window as being the height of your document, and now I want this div not to just cover, say, the first row of it, but to actually fill it out. So stupid cross-platform kinds of issues you'll run into, and uh, we look forward to seeing you tackle the seemingly simple but uh, sadly real-world frustration of having the thing be big but still leave room at, say, the top of the page for a form field. And this, it's very easy just to add a form field for the top of the page, as we'll see in a little bit. But what happens, though, if you then proceed to say in some browsers that this div, the map, should be 100%, if the space for your form at the top of the page takes up this much space, like 100 pixels, the map will similarly on some browsers fill the page, but then you will be able to click the scroll bar and scroll down 100 pixels and see nothing at the bottom of the page, which is arguably you know, not a functional bug, but certainly an aesthetic bug. And so just expect nuisances like that, which sadly are real world. So we can get away with saying it will be a learning exercise. All right, so here's Google 2. Dot HTML. So what's going on in this one? Well, here's my initialize function. What I'm doing again is uh, instantiating my GMAP2 object, setting the center arbitrarily to be on Cambridge, same zoom level, and now our story seems to add three additional calls. So I wanted to add some controls to my map so you can actually zoom in and move around with the controls. I also wanted to support some types because I kind of like their hybrid feature and their satellite feature. Well, currently through the version 2 of Google's API, these are all configurable features. Turn them on, turn them off. Well, to add a control, as they call it, to the map, I just call the method on the map object called add control, and then I pass it a reference to the type of control that I want the map to display. In this case, the documentation taught me that a G large map control represents what we know as the large map control on the top left of a typical Google map, like the slider. Uh, left, right, up, down, and then the zoom level. And then this GMAP type control is that thing in the top right of a typical Google map that is, I think, what is it, normal and hybrid and, or street and hybrid and something, satellite. And then I like this feature, right? So it really didn't cost me much time to add a function, a method called to enable scroll wheel zoom, which quite simply enables that feature where you can scroll in and it zooms in and zooms out. It's a really neat feature. Single function call makes my site look all the cooler. So let's pull this up. So in Google2.html, we now have something that's still filling the page, but we now have our large control at top left, and now we also have those controls at top right. And they function exactly as they would typical Google map. All right, so I'm one step closer to doing more interesting things, but we're just scratching the surface of the types of features we can turn on and off. Because at the end of the day, this isn't really much of a mashup, right? Now I'm just making people go to 
cs75.net to search the maps as opposed to google.com. So certainly we can do better. Well, let's see what step we can take next. So here's google3.html. And here too, all that much magic going on until we see this call. So now we're beginning to actually behave like programmers who have to copy paste some examples online. I'm calling now this method called addListener, which is a, a static method effectively in the G event uh, class. But JavaScript doesn't really have classes, so I'm kind of abusing these terms here. But it gets the point across and sort of is how uh, some people will tend to talk anyway. So I'm calling addListener, which we did see, I think, in uh, YUI's library for adding event listeners. And just infer, what is this doing, would you guess? Perfect. So upon so Google has decided that beyond the typical events that exist within the confines of a browser, like click and submit and load and unload all the sort of basics, they're going to sort of borrow the spirit of those events and define a few of their own. Uh, one of them relates to dragging. One of them result. Uh, relates just to moving, whether you clicked and dragged or searched or did anything like that. So what I did after looking up the API docs is I realized, oh, there's a move end event which gets fired any time the map is moving, 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 and then the movement ends. Because what I want to do in my very simple page here, google3.html, is I want to detect the end of such movement and yell at the user if they're trying to move away from Cambridge's center. So what's going to happen if, if that's the case? Well, where am I adding this listener? I'm adding it to the map object. So there, this is where we're listening. We're not waiting for something else to stop moving, just the map. This is the name of the event. So that came from the API reference. And now this is the event handler. So remember that you can have these, sort of, these lambda functions in JavaScript, aimless, anonymous functions that get called in this case, whenever this event is fired. So the syntax for that, and people will use different indentation and line spacing, but you just call function without arguments. In this case, there's no need for one. Curly brace, now I'm implementing a function here. Um, it's a closure, a function closure effectively. And um, the only thing the function is going to do is output or generate this alert. And then notice to close the curly brace to end the function's definition, close parenthesis to close the method call, Semicolon. So what's the net result? If I go over to google3.html, we'll see that this example looks I turned off the control, so it's pretty much like Google One. But if I now try to click and drag, 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 let, oh, it's going to yell at me as soon as the map has, has stopped moving. So now we're one step closer to doing something interesting with this data and actually interacting with the map. So any questions thus far? Ah, good question. What's the answer? It's just going to stay there because the only behavior that I've event handler is just to print that alert. So let's just verbally actually consider the alternative. If I wanted the map to snap back to where it was, to be really obnoxious, just um, procedurally, like what would I have to do here? So call set center again. Now where could I, what could I do? Well, I could just hard code it. Right, because if I only want them looking there, I could add this call here, and let's see if that would do the trick. So I've just modified this, Google 3. Let me go ahead and reload the page. Click, drag, 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 let go. Where do you think you're going? OK. Oh, because that's the other move. Yeah. So. <laughs> Right, so set center implies movement. So there is this difference that I alluded to. There's this notion of dragging, start drag, and end drag, or something named something like that. But movement is more general. So we've already sort of created a kind of a significant problem because there's no the only close box means <laughs> right. So you, you might very well run into this. And I found in Windows, if you hold Alt F4 enough, sometimes it goes away. <laughs> Otherwise, if your computer came with this thing called Task Manager. This is the other way to stop your infinite loop. So thank you very much for that demonstration. Um, but the short answer is that the map is only going to do what you instruct it to do. So this was a, a bad decision.
function, but we could have kept track. We could have approached this in a number of ways. Like this is a hard-coded value, but that suggests some inelegance. So maybe we could start keeping track of where the user last was. So yes, there are going to be methods associated with the map that will give you your current latitude and longitude. And you can tuck those away, for instance, in, say, a global variable. And then I could just snap back to a lat longitude uh, variables value or something like that. But here we need to be a little more careful. And I won't go off on a tangent here as to how to fix that. But there are different events that we could capture there. Maybe we could keep a counter that tells us how many times we've started snapping back. Um, I would defer to your programmatic abilities as to how to approach that seeming logic problem. But what more can we do? Well, let's take a look at Google4.html. So what's neat about Google 4.html is that it finally starts to ma uh, mark up the data. So what's really neat about Google Maps isn't just that you can find directions and such like that. You can actually use it to present users with your own data set. So if you wanted to point out the location of Harvard Hall, I could mark Harvard Hall by somehow figuring out its latitude and longitude. And that wasn't hard. There's, I googled la find latitude longitude. It gave me a dozens of different sites with which I could just click and drag, ironically, other people's Google Maps to find latitudes and longitudes and then paste into my own mashup. But there we have a marker for Harvard Hall 202. Nothing else, right? You still can't search this map and you still can't control it in any way. But how did I go about positioning that? Well, let's scroll. Again, the HTML markup is sort of non-existent here. So again, this really is a, a programmer's approach, even though we're still creating dynamic web pages here. Turns out that I only needed to do a couple of things. So I already instantiated the map, set the center. All it takes to create one of these default markers that looks like these little red markers is call new gmarker. Uh, pass to it the location, the point that you want to put the base of that marker, and that I just figured out by hand. And then what you have to do is add to the map the notion of an overlay. Think of it like a transparency that you can just put on top of, on top of, on top of, so that you can actually put data on top of Google's default data, which are the roads or the photograph, the aerial photographs and the like. So the effect of that is to do what we just saw. Yeah. Most likely, yeah. By default, it puts you. Actually, yeah, it was. I, I didn't look closely at the code, but yes, they're just putting you, I think, at an arbitrary point. Because when I first typed in not Cambridge Mass, but Boston Mass, actually, let me see if I can example, because it was kind of a funny realization. Learn from our lessons and not use IE again. All right, so let me search now for Cambridge Mass, but Boston Mass, which was, I think, the demo I did. Yes, it puts me on the harbor. <laughs> so it's a guy, the guy thought of this scenario where it just, I think, drives in some direction until it hits a road. And so we seem to be, I think, in East Boston now. Um, I, the short answer is I don't really know how this is implemented. I suspect it's being something like that, um, unless the roads themselves are exposed as lines or as polygons. So let me take the fifth on any questions related to this. But I encourage you to play with it, since it's a fun <laughs> waste of time. All right, so this is a neat example, perhaps, in that we're now finally adding data and we're actually mashing up information. Granted, it's static information. It's a hard-coded value. I can click all day. Nothing's happening to it. And nice if I could use this now as like an informational marker. So we want to integrate this maybe into the course's website, show students where the location of Harvard Hall is, but then give them more information about the room. Maybe a student wonders how many seats are in Harvard Hall? What AV resources does this room provide? Wouldn't it be nice if we could click that thing and answer those kinds of questions? No one finds my contrived example amusing. No? <laughs> so, all right. Well, I did it anyway. Google5.html demonstrates this notion of Google's uh, G-Info window class. Okay, and again, I'm abusing some of these terms here, but a G-Info window exists in, uh, in Google's API. Every map has a G-Info window associated with it. It's just hidden by default. So functionally, the showing of that little cartoon bubble that you've seen presumably on the real Google Maps boils down to positioning it at a certain location and then revealing it after filling it with content. And the neat thing is you can fill it with just textual content, like this is Harvard Hall, or you can actually put hyperlinks and other HTML markup and actually create a really neat interface. So how is this 
going to work. Well, now things are getting a little more complicated, but still just a few lines of code. I'm creating my map. Now I'm instantiating one of those glat longs. So in the past, I've just been passing that constructor call to as the argument. But this time, I want to keep the return value around. So I'm assigning it to a variable called point. Uh, so then I'm setting the center of the map to that point, but at a zoom level of 17. So it's zoomed in a little closer so that we can see the, uh, where the building should be a little more easily. Now I'm setting the map type. So there's these different map types, as you already know from being a Google user, of the street maps, the hybrid maps, which shows the streets and aerial photography, and then just the satellite maps. So I want it to be a hybrid, because it's not all that interesting to show you a little cartoon picture of where the building is. Let's see if we can see the building from the sky. And now I'm going to mark Harvard Hall by creating one of those markers at that same point, uh, adding an overlay, uh, just as we did before. But now I want to do some magic. So I want to actually add an event listener to that marker. So it's the same principle as before, but now what I'm going to listen for is the click event, not the move end event or some other event. So I'm going to call this method add listener. What do I want to listen on? The marker, not the map, but the marker. Anytime that marker receives the click event, I want my function to get invoked. Well, what's my function do? What defines a variable? Perfect. Perfect. So it creates some HTML, which I stored in a variable just so it didn't get completely messy as the second argument there. And then I'm calling the maps open info window. So I'm not creating the window because, again, as an aside, it already exists. It's just hidden. Open the info window in effectively HTML mode so it actually parses this content at that point, passing in this string of HTML. Now, notice there's some neat things that should become um, increasingly obvious as you start writing these tricks, what's really neat about these function closures, defining these nameless functions, is that you can access in them variables that are actually local to the function that defined them. So this is a really useful way of encapsulating within a function without passing it as like an argument, a variable from another scope. Because if you think about it this way, if I factored this out, and actually put, defined it down here as a function called foo. And I tried to call map.openInfoWindowHTML, what result, what would the result be? It would fail. It would fail. There is, no there is no map variable in that context if I put this function out here, right? I would get some kind of syntax error, i.e. would create that little yellow icon and say map is not defined. Well, why is that? Map is defined in this context. Now, the simple fix, especially if you're not really savvy with this stuff yet, is, well, just don't declare var map inside of my initialized function. Just put it where? All right, so work to put it globally, so to speak, inside the C data block, but outside the initialize functions block. But you could pass it in as an argument, too. So there's many different ways to approach this. but. Perhaps the cleanest one, or the one that keeps everything very nicely encapsulated without exposing variables and such unnecessarily, is to use these function closures, which do, because they're defined line namelessly, have access to variables like map from that function scope, but are completely self-contained. So take that away is actually a really useful trick, especially in keeping the code sort of and, and yes, encapsulated. If you were trying to add a uh so, good question. So, if the alternative to this approach, and I'll temporarily delete this, is if I did have that function called foo, I could just do that. Now, the catch is that the event handlers typically don't expect the handler functions to take any arguments. Some of them might. But you typically, the only argument they would expect would be a reference to the event itself. So again, um, let me simplify. So you can't do this, for instance, or you can't do this. What you can do if you really want to pass in an argument is you can define the closure like this again and then call foo of map. But in this particular context, that's sort of completely useless because we could just do it the other way. But that would be the approach if you need to hard code arguments into a function call as part of as an event handling mechanism, you would have to do something like this. 
And let me not go down the road I started to verbally about some of the arguments being default arguments. It kind of depends on how this thing is defined and if it automatically. Let me roll back. If you didn't quite follow that, that's totally fine. Um, ideal takeaway for now minimally would be just understanding that this does work and why this has value. So what's the effect? So this was uh, about later. <laughs> So let's go back to the index, google5.html. So now here's our uh, hybrid map, so roads and satellite imagery. I did actually put the thing right on top of Harvard Hall. And now because we've added that event listener, if I click on this thing, now I get that little cartoon bubble. Moreover, inside of it is this link, which now takes me to the AV resources for this particular room. So underwhelming demonstration, but is beginning to piece together different data sets and sort of dynamically overlaying content on what otherwise is a very plain map. Their demo. All right, let me scroll back for just one moment and hopefully either admit to just being, uh, teach a lesson by way of my own mistake. Um, these are just recaps from the documentation as to um, how these functions are defined. We'll come back to the actual reference docs in a moment. Quick recap on latitude, longitude, because I wasted about two hours of my life confusing the two. Um, so longitude apparently goes the long way around the Earth, at least if you think of it as like an ellipsoid, which I forgot from grade school. So the blue line represents a longitudinal line. Latitude in red represents a, a horizontal line, so to speak. So we're in this, I'll just admit to this, so that it never happens to you. Even though everyone seems to say latitude comma longitude and all of Google's functions take latitude comma longitude, if you come from a Cartesian world, that's sort of x comma y. But this is really y comma x. So if you do that and get them confused like I did with the mashup we'll look at tonight, uh, all your math is wrong. And um, you start putting Harvard shuttle buses in the river, um, <laughs> as we'll see. So here, too, to make perfectly clear what we mean by a longitudinal line and a latitude line, it's dividing the world up into this sort of grid. And I point this out now only to say that, for instance, when we've seen 41-ish comma negative 72 for Cambridge, we'll just notice that if we consider uh, this line here to be 0 degrees to the west is effectively the negative direction. So negative 71 indeed puts us in Massachusetts or thereabouts. And then 42 positive, uh, which is AKA north, puts us right smack dab on Cambridge. So that's where these numbers come from. Realize you'll see different notations, which is relevant if you really get into this project and start poking around with different um, GPS coordinates and the like. Just know that there are many different ways to view Cambridge Mass 02138. There's the degrees, minutes, seconds approach. So if you ever see something like 42 degrees, 22 minutes, 30 seconds north, that translates to the picture scenario we just described. Similarly, does 71 degrees, um, 6 minutes, 22 seconds west translate to negative 72? So just be, realize that um, the negative positive thing is also important. Another way of viewing that is explicitly with the plus and the minus signs here. And then there's this thing known as decimal degrees. Nicely enough, Google understands both. Um, but I think it sh shows you by default the second, I think if you paste in a value, it displays it, it converts it for you. So this is decimal degrees. These values are identical to the ones up there. And the mapping between, say, 42 uh, degrees, 22 minutes, and 30 seconds is if you convert the minutes and seconds to seconds. So do 22 times 60 plus 30, and then divide that by 3,600 seconds. That will give you 0.375. So that's the mapping between these two. Probably don't need to know it, but if you're trying to find things on the map, just realize that there are these different conventions. And Google, for its arguments, expects uh, decimal degrees with the positive and minus signs, because it's kind of hard to represent the decimal sign in ASCII. Okay, so use the numeric values only. Uh, oh, and I pointed this out. It's kind of slow. I'm hoping to find a better tool. But the tool that I used by having Googled for find latitude, longitude, Google Maps led me to earthtools.org, which puts a nice crosshair in the middle of the page. And you can move the Google Map around. And wherever you leave the crosshair, I left it on top of Harvard Hall, it then tells you in the up left, uh, upper corner of the page what the latitude, longitude coordinates are. So just useful for finding things. All right. So what more? can we do with this? Well, let's take a look at the last of this demo here. So now I wanted to, in similar fashion to, I think, lecture zero, when I made fake Google version one, I wanted to make fake Google version two, where I now have my own 
map interface. And notice here I totally cut corners by not having my map fill the page because I knew it was going to be hard. So now I'm just hard coding the sizes like whatever this is, 320 by 240 or thereabouts. So now I can still search for things, Cambridge Mass 02138, go, and the map moves to that location, but this thing's running on cs75.net which means there is no Google maps.google.com to do that movement for me. I need to move the user in response to any queries, because this is now my mashup, my domain. So that begs the question, how do you now move the map in response to not even latitude, longitude, but sort of a free form string query? Well, fortunately, Google provides, beyond these UI mechanisms, number of services, so to speak. One of them is called geocoding. And geocoding is sort of the, the buzzword that maps things like Cambridge Mass 02138 to GPS coordinates or some such thing. So in uh, Google 6.html, notice that my web page, a little more complicated, but just because there's some HTML markup there. So I've got a form that goes nowhere, but on submit calls what function? It calls the go function. It passes in the value of this. What's this in this context? The form, because it's an attribute of the form element. So this is self-referential to that DOM element, which is the form element. So this dot address, so that's uh, the first input field, dot value. So remember, when you have these um, input mechanisms, you want the value, not the actual object called address. So this dot address dot value is going to represent what string when I hit go Cambridge Mass 02138 and that's going to get passed apparently to a function called go which apparently is defined up here but let's scroll back a little further to my initialize function just to see what's going on here alright so my initialize function looks pretty cookie cutter from before create the map set the center and this is interesting instantiate one of these G client geocoder objects. And I'm keeping it global just because it's nice and easy to be able to use it down here in my go function. Hence, if I scroll up, what is there got to be up here for this to work? Softball question here, right? There's got to be a global variable called map. So down here, I'm assigning that variable, the return value of this constructor. And now, just in the interest of good UI design, I wanted to make sure that the user can start typing right away. So I'm giving focus to the address element in the zeroth form on the page, which I know to be the only one. So that was a safe hard coding. But now let's see what happens when I do actually click go. Maybe let's try London, UK. Go. Well, that seems to work too. And hopefully, I myself did not have to do any kind of logical parsing of this thing, because that would have required a great deal of effort and also an awareness of what maps to what in the world. So this is where that geocoder service comes into play. Ah, here. So center the map on 0, 0. So when you first load up this page, I wanted it to just center on the middle of the world. So zero degrees, zero degrees. That's all. I, just for dramatic fit. Completely arbitrary. All right, so how does the Go function work? Well, here too, I mean, this is why mashups are so compelling. Someone else did all of the hard work, and you can focus on just getting the feature implemented that you want. So one, I'm going to do a quick sanity check. Let's just make sure my init function worked OK, just by checking the value of that thing. And let's just ignore requests if, uh, if it's going to break. And now I'm calling the geocoders method get lat long passing in the address, which is just a string, and what am I, generally speaking, passing in as the second argument, apparently? So, so I'm passing in a function, that I'm, a nameless function, but more generally, this seems to be some kind of event handler, right? This is, this, at the end of the day, this is all Ajaxy stuff, right? Asynchronicity is one of the underlying principles. I don't want the whole application to get hung up while I'm just trying to look up this particular answer. What are the latitude, longitude, coordinates for Cambridge Mass 02138? Rather, I want Google's API to just get back to me when it has the answer and not w expect me to just twiddle my thumbs, so to speak, waiting and waiting and waiting and blocking for that response. So what I'm effectively doing here is passing it an event handler that will get invoked as soon as the Ajax call, or whatever it is underneath the hood, 
comes back to me. So what do I want to happen? Well, from having read the documents, the reference, um, the reference API, I realized that, oh, it doesn't just take a function. It takes a function that takes one argument. Because what, this, what Google's API is going to do is, yes, invoke my function, but pass it an argument. And that's a useful thing, because my goal here is to get back what answer. What's, what are the coordinates? What was the point, so to speak, of this call? So how do I get that? Well, I read the docs and realized I have to define not only an event handler, but one that takes a single argument. I'm going to call that argument point. And now what I'm going to do is check, well, if there's, point is null, that's Google's way of telling me, eh, I don't know what you searched for, so let's not do anything. No user feedback for now. Or actually, yes, let's just say address not found. But otherwise, if it is a non-null argument, that means it's encapsulating one of those lat long um, objects, or that's, that's what it represents. So let's set the center of the map to that point, and just for clarity's sake, let's arbitrarily always go back to this particular zoom level. So this geocoder service then takes a fairly arbitrary string and converts it, so to speak, to latitude longitude in the form of one of those g lat long objects, which gets passed back to my ha event handler as an argument which I am then free to do anything I want with, such as pass it to set center. Um, what generates the, the point parameter? What generates the point parameter? Google's API. So we can also. Oh, I could have called it foo. It could be called anything. It just has to be a placeholder for the argument that they are going to pass in. So this sort of speaks to what Morris was asking about earlier. You know, what sort of predetermines what kind of function you can put there? Well, in this case, if you didn't provide this argument, you effectively would have no way of doing anything with the answer other than saying yay or nay, I got some answer back. Yeah? Can you do those callback Yep, these are callback functions. Um, event handlers. The event is the AJAX response came back. Keep listening, listening, listening until it gets exactly. What? Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's not so much listening, listening, listening. What you're doing with this function call to get lat long is you're registering the event handler with that function. So with that function's implementation, if we looked at the source code for Google for get lat long, presumably it has a local variable called. Uh, return value or uh, return address that's being assigned the address, this, this function pointer effectively. And so when this function, get lat long, is done doing its thing with the XML HTTP request and gets back an answer from Google servers, it's just dereferencing that function pointer, so to speak, and calling the function you told it to call. And again, I'm abusing terms here because JavaScript doesn't really use some of these semantics, but the ideas are still there, function pointers and classes and methods and such. OK, so let's see the effect, just to be clear. So let's type in something completely arbitrary like this, which hopefully does not exist in the world, go. And apparently, it's not found. And this is pretty darn fast. Let's try uh, San Francisco, California. It's pretty fast, even though there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the hood that Google is taking care of for us. Yeah? Because um, I've had, I've done mistakes in Google Maps where I put my comma in the wrong place, mm -hmm. and it gives me multiple answers back. Like, did you mean, you know, one main street here, one main street here, one main street here? Like, how do you check the search for Springfield? That's a good question. OK. Uh, so it seems to be, in this case, I, di I didn't give a zoom control. Anyone know which Springfield has Jefferson? Probably the one l closest. OK, so let's, what? Madison Street. Oh, OK. So let me, let me try to answer that question definitively by going to it's actually a perfect segue in the reference documentation, which is this guy here. So these are sort of the, once you've sort of acquainted yourself with the API, if you wish, with the examples and whatnot, this is where real programmers hang out at these two particular links. And frankly, real programmers will hang out if, like me, in the Google group where people talk about the things that the reference documentation doesn't make clear. So here's the API reference. The question at hand is the geocoder object. So this is the reference docs, and I'll admit that it's actually could be a little more straightforward. 
Um, control F is your friend with this particular documentation. It is pretty well documented, but I think they stopped short of making it sort of like Java doc and nicely hyperlinked. So again, control F and ironically, the Google search engine for searching the site is pretty useful. So G geo. OK, so there's the G client geo code. I'm serious about control F. I used it all night. So click that link. Here's the class. All right, so apparently you can do some neat caching, but I'll wave my hands at that for now. Here's the function, the method we were using, get lat long. So it takes an address argument and then a callback argument. Here's the formal description of what we sort of introduced practically. And what it looks like, what's that? The best, uh, yes, so the best match, whereas this one looks like you'll get back uh, callback function made different. One or more place mark on it. Yeah, so it looks like if you do want to get back a list of results instead of Google's opinion, then you can go with this, uh, this instance here and iterate over the objects that are returned. So I presume that's how one would do that. So, all right. Other questions about the API? All right, let's um, take a peek at one thing here. So just to whet your appetite, not pat myself on the back, the demo that will come back, I thought it's all fine and good to do these six little demos, but what you'll see after break is this instance of Shuttleboy, which now integrates live GPS data from the shuttle buses that should still be going around campus for the next couple of hours into a map. This is not moving because this is a PowerPoint slide right now, but if we actually pull up the web version, those little red dots will start moving after this. Let's take our five minute break. All right, so we're back. So that intro with the Wii video introduced you to that globe where you could find news articles from different geographic regions. And as promised, that's meant to be inspiration for Project 3, whereby the goal of Project 3 is going to be to take uh, maps from Google Maps and news articles from Google News and smash them together into a mashup that shows you on a Google map stories or markers to stories from the local area. But if you zoom out, for instance, to see not only Cambridge, but maybe Boston or Massachusetts or the whole United States, the expectation is that we'll see markers from different geographic regions of the US with localized news. Now there's a lot of towns and there's a lot of zip codes in the US, so you're certainly not going to populate it with thousands of markers. So there's going to be some interesting design judgment calls in there. But how could you even begin to go about mashing up these two data sets? Well, the means by which I thought we would uh, sort of get you along your way was this is actually a little toy that was sort of dear to my heart when I was an under this Unix program called at the time Boy, which the which was to help undergrads find the next few shuttles that were coming up at a given time of the day. So this is actually a web-based recreation of what was once a Unix uh, command line program. But if someone wanted to go from say to Memorial Hall would see something like this and it would update itself in real time. So 12 minutes from now, if you actually maybe more apropos here would be right? so you can look up. come on. Oh, 26 minutes. If, if, uh, so you're stuck with us for 26 minutes if you want to head north in that direction. But the program was meant to look up the shuttle schedules and just find out what the next several um, possibilities were. Well, enter the world of GPS. When shuttle services installed GPS on their buses, uh, they then partnered called Translocation, I think. And actually, before I put my foot in my mouth like I did in Lecture Zero, does anyone here work for shuttle services like you did for harvard.edu? <laughs> no? Full disclosure here. All right. So they have this web, which I think is a wonderful step in the right direction, certainly an interesting uh, direction. But this company that is, supply, that is processing the GPS data from Harvard shuttle buses decided to do it with a Java applet, which frankly I think sucks. Like Java applets are not something I am personally a fan of, but it does show them on the screen exactly where the shuttle buses are. And you'll see that it's moving in real time. So I saw this and was like, all right, so neat. So these buses have some GPS data, but I just learned the Google Maps API recently. And it's kind of an interesting opportunity to now lay that same data wherever it's coming from on top of a Google map. And so enter the world of Shuttle Boy. So in Shuttle Boy's take on this world, we now have the ability, if we go to, 
And this isn't really self-promotion because you going here really doesn't benefit me or yourselves if you don't take the shuttle. But if you click on Google Map plus GPS, what we now have is an embedded Google Map done much like we've been talking today. And if we wait for traffic to pass, those little dots should start moving once the vans themselves do. Otherwise, this will be, oh, there we go. <laughs> so that bus is out and now actually going up Mass Ave. And actually, kind of neat, it's, uh, well, I guess it's a few blocks away, up by the comments. So there's some data feed coming now into this website. There's JavaScript running on this web page. And it's somehow taking that live feed of data, which is updating, I think, every two seconds, and telling those markers to move. So how did I go about doing this? Well. Let's take a look. So if I view the source for this page, what we will see is a bunch of HTML. And then there's a bunch of JavaScript that relates to the real-time clock that's on the page. But the real magic, HTML-wise, is just this. Right? I knew the size of the map that I wanted to embed. I knew it has to be a div. I, need, I know there needs to be nothing in it. But I knew I have to give it an ID, in this case of quote unquote map. So presumably all of the magic, so to speak, is now happening in a JavaScript file. And that's indeed the case. So I'll open it actually via the command prompt here. So I'm going to go. This is actually running in my FAS account. So shuttleboy.com is just doing a stupid little frame trick to mask somewhat the URL. But in my google.js file, in my google.js file, we have the following. So this first part is going to look a little sloppy, but I needed some way of planting the shuttle stops on the route, which are represented there in blue. They don't change, and they're, in that sense, they're constants. And I only had to do it once, so I took about 10 minutes and sort of with the help of like earthtools.org found the uh, latitude, longitude coordinates for all those blue dots. And then I just hard coded them in here. And it's never going to change for the most part, so I thought this was an acceptable design decision. Notice that I've got an array up there. So remember in JavaScript, you can declare an array with just some empty square braces. And now this is just a little trick. I didn't hard code 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Because arrays in JavaScript are really like vectors, they dynamically resize. If you just keep putting the next object at points.length, points.length, this thing's automatically getting incremented. So it's a nice way of saving yourself some hard coding of constants. But now let's focus on the meat of the program. So here's going to be a global reference to the, the GMAP2 object. Um, now I've got a couple of arrays being defined here, apparently in my, the old school syntax, but that's fine for now. Change that later. We'll come back to why I have this cache in a moment. Well, here's my initialize function, and it looks pretty darn similar to what we've been doing thus far. So first I'm just going to bail if the browser doesn't support this. It'll just show nothing. Uh, then I'm going to make sure that I remember to put the map element on the page, just to do another sanity check here. Now I'm going to instantiate the map. No magic there. We've seen that before. I'm going to center it. I just figured out manually where I wanted this map to begin by default. This is the zoom level I want it to be at default. Those are never going to change. I'm going to add the controls so that people can actually interact with it if they care to. I uh, really like the scroll wheel, so I turned that on. Continuous zoom just does some interpolation between different zoom levels so that rather than go from one image to the next, it instead sort of um, uh, what would you call it? it? It zooms in on the given image, which really messes things up aesthetically until the new images have downloaded. I don't think I did that explanation justice, but it's just an aesthetic feature. And now I want to display the stop. So here's a little JavaScript loop construct. You could have used a normal for loop or a while. This for i in pointers just has the effect of incrementing i again and again and again up to the value of pointers, or up to the value of points. So what's going on? Well. I'm now not going to be content with Google's default markers, because I didn't want all those red markers representing stops and then red markers representing buses, because no one would know what the heck is going on. So I poked around actually on Google's site and found a little trove of uh, images, pings, to use. And I downloaded one of their blue circle markers, dot ping. And what I'm doing is not only creating a var uh, marker, like we saw done earlier, but I'm actually stylizing that marker with an icon. And the steps to do this are to instantiate the G icon, uh, which one, I don't think I needed this uh, default icon. I forget what this particular argument does. But setting this property of the icon object now says that this should be the image to actually use. This is the size that I want it to show, 10 by 10. Uh, this is where I want the icon to be anchored. So you can anchor it on, say, the bottom left pixel, the bottom right pixel, those kinds of things for positioning purposes. These things. 
Now, this is some interesting script just to get familiar with. What is this doing in programmatic terms? So yes, it's preparing options for marker, but what is this syntax doing? It's creating a hash, an object, um, yeah, it, uh, an associative array of, that is an object inside the curly braces that has one property called icon whose value is icon. So it's identically named, which is perhaps confusing, but this is the key value, this is the key, this is the value. So the key is just a string. I could have put it in quotes, and in fact, you'll often see things quoted for clarity's sake. But icon refers to this thing. Now I go ahead and place the marker. But this time, I'm putting a marker on the ith point, because this is just an array, because I'm iterating over it. But I'm passing in options, which was an optional argument. Because in the past, when I set a, to created a marker, we didn't bother with an icon. And the effect is to just keep overlaying the marker on marker on marker on marker until by default I have all these blue markers and nothing else. In fact, let me temporarily turn off this update function and if I reload my map here, what you'll see, the same effect of the blue dots going down, but no shuttles exist yet because it's apparently that update function that is doing them. So thus far, this isn't really a mashup. All I'm doing is stealing Google's hard work, embedding it into my web page, putting on some hard-coded icons. Really, mashups sort of hint at this idea of integrating data or changing data, live data. Well, we need to start getting those GPS coordinates if we want to start plotting the dots. So apparently, at the end of this initialize function, I call update. And let's fast forward now to the update function. The update function is using um, Yahoo's uh, Ajax library, just because I like the abstraction. It's a one call, async request, which I think we used in our last example two weeks ago. I'm going to use the get method. I'm going to have the Ajax request pull that file, ajax.php. And I have another one of those nameless objects here with one property, success, indicating that if that Ajax call is successful, invoke what? Handler, which is defined right here. So again, this sort of speaks to the utility of these Ajax frameworks. One line of code and bam, the Ajax call is done for me. I'm not handling errors because it's sort of acceptable for me if the call fails, just don't move the buses. The users, my users really aren't going to care. Um, but invoke this function if there is in fact a success. Now here too, Yahoo's documentation told me that the handler, even though I specify it by its name, had better expect to receive one argument. And that argument, thanks to Yahoo, is going to be effectively that uh, XML HTTP request object. So here's my handler function, giving it O for object generically. What am I going to do? Well, it turns out I can infer that my Ajax.php is returning dynam data dynamically in what format? Seems to be, a, it's an object, it's really a string, but it can be treated apparently as JSON, which we saw last week. So I'm just turning that into now an object called points. Now I'm getting the date and time for reasons I'll point out in a moment. And now I'm just iterating over all of my, uh, for I and point, yeah, all of the points. So what I've gotten back is an object, or actually what I've gotten back is an array that I've called points, and I know this because I wrote ajax.php, and this array contains what? Well, what information am I going to need every two seconds in order to put, to plant a bus on the map? So probably it's latitude and longitude, and for caching reasons, a unique ID for that bus, so that I can avoid recreating buses every two seconds, and I can just move extant buses. So let's take a look at what this Ajax call is really giving me. So let me pull up that URL in my browser. Put it in here. Uh, so if I paste in that list, OK, it's going to try to open this thing now. So let's see what it decides to open it with. Uh, select the program from a list. All right, how about we'll use TextPad. So this is the response from Ajax.php. I'm going to turn on word wrap. It'll look a little messy, but this is the crazy string that's coming back. So there's a lot of syntax in there. It's compact, though, which is just useful for performance reasons. But what's the outermost symbols? S square brackets, which indicates what type of object? It's an array. So we have an array of stuff. Well, what's the stuff? Well, if we start with the first thing after the bracket, and I'm just going to scroll right to the first comma, this is the first thing in that array. Well, let me copy that, and we'll just paste it down here to see it more closely. So that's this thing. Well, anything between curly braces is just a nameless 
object that has property value pairs. So what does this first object contain? Apparently a string ID, which represents that bus. The uh, longitude coordinates, which is a really precise floating point value. JavaScript uses 64-bit precision, uh, which is good for the case of GPS here. Latitude is the 42 point something. So what I have is enough information to now plant a marker on the map. Now there's a lot of other stuff there, but it's just comma separated objects, comma separated objects. Not very clear to a human, which is why there is some value in using say XML as the transport mechanism, but this is arguably more efficient. And what's the upside of using JSON here as opposed to XML at this blinking point of the story? Right, it's just so easy. The parsing sort of happens for you because you're just evaluating what you know to be a well-formed JavaScript string, provided you wrote ajax.php correctly, and there's none of those annoying DOM functions to iterate over the root, and then its children, and then its children, which is a lot of hoops to jump through when one line can just give you a JavaScript object. So what's happening here? So if I've never seen this bus before, and I have a little caching mechanism going on here, I'm going to create an icon using something called blank.ping, which is that little red marker icon. I'm going to prepare options just like before, and I'm going to place the marker just putting it at a new glat longitude object. At what point? Well, the ith points latitude coordinate, the ith points longitudinal coordinate, and that has the effect, once overlaid, of putting the bus on the route. What I'm also going to do now, and this was sort of for performance reasons and memory leak reasons, I want to remember that this marker has already been replaced, has already been placed. So I created this sort of cache called markers, which is just an associative array uh, via which I'm hashing on the ID of that bus, and just remembering that the bus called ABCDEFG is represented currently with this JavaScript object. And the reason for that is that I'm updating the page every two seconds. I don't want to just clear all the markers and then re-instantiate another two or three or four bus markers every two seconds. Really, I just want to move the markers if they're already there. So this is my sort of global way of remembering those markers. And now I'm also remembering timestamps because I decided that the very simple way of remembering if a bus goes offline is if I haven't seen it in a while effectively, I'm just going to remove it from the, schedule, from the map altogether. can implement that in different ways, but this only took a few lines of code in total, because otherwise, if I've already seen a bus before, that is, it's in my markers array, my little cache, well, then what I want to do is grab that extant marker from my cache, go ahead and call that markers set lat lang method again, moving it to this new location. Now I do need a new one of these objects because what I have are just the points as floating point values. And now I'm just going to check if that marker is hidden for some reason, go ahead and show it. Because at one point I had a hide show feature just to hide, uh, which I do still have here. But then down here, after all of that is done, if I'm going to just quickly iterate over all the buses, and if I didn't get an update from ajax.php pertaining to some bus, I'm not going to get rid of it yet, because maybe it'll come online again in a few minutes or seconds or hours. I'm just going to hide it. So the marker's still there, but not moving or actually visible. And now I sort of recursively, in effect, call myself by setting a timeout two seconds from now to invoke myself again. And so I've intentionally induced an infinite loop, but it at least doesn't have an alert box that's getting in the way of real life. So the net result then is that every two seconds, oh, we've got to replace that uh, update call. Every two seconds, ajax.php is getting called on my server, on people.fas. It's returning a new JSON string. And the JavaScript code is parsing that string and checking where its location is. And it's just moving it again and again and again. So this is arguably a mashup in that it's mashing together a Google map with a live feed of GPS data from that ajax.php file. So enter into the world project three. So you'll be using Google Maps. You don't want to place just buses or just markers that are moving, but rather you want to place them based on how many news articles exist for a given geographic location by way of zip code. So what does that mean for us here exactly? Well, take a look at the following. News.google or keywords in today's news. But if you click on advanced news search and then scroll down to this part, turns out you can return only articles about a local area. So if I only want articles about, say, 02138, I'm going to type in 02138, enter, 
And now I get back some um, news that somehow relates to Massachusetts or Cambridge or at least the general area. All right, well, that's all fine and good, but this looks like a screen scraping nightmare, right? So what's the solution, hopefully? Well, an API or even simpler, well, like RSS, Atom, sort of an alternative to as I'm using Firefox, going to sort of dumb it down and display it as a feed. But what's going on underneath the hood is that this is just a big XML file. And in fact, if I, let's see if it lets me do this, view page source. Uh, okay, so there's no line breaks, but do you see the XML? Okay, so this is just one big XML file. All right, specifically RSS. And we've seen RSS before because RSS is standardized. And generally speaking, an RSS feed contains absolutely an RSS element as the root element then a channel child, and then zero or more item elements. And each of those items in this context represents a news article, much like the course's website. When we talked about this a few weeks ago in the context of the forum, we too syndicate the most recent announcements and such by way of RSS just by creating an item. Now, there's only a few of these fields are required, and I'll defer to the law school's uh, uh, specification for what the fields are, but probably useful to folks trying to implement a mashup of news with Google Maps is probably the title of an article, probably the link for an article, so that if I click a marker on your Google Map and we get a little cartoon bubble, well, you can presumably show what kinds of things there. The headlines, similar to what the Wii does, just a list of headlines, click any of those headlines, maybe you go to this link element, but realize there's a gotcha here too. If you start searching, if the user zooms out, and they are um, therefore within range of Boston and Cambridge, maybe even Springfield, Massachusetts. That's a pretty big area, but there might be some overlap in these articles, right? Because we're clearly seeing in this page news that is a bit beyond Cambridge itself and seems to just somehow tangentially relate to Massachusetts. So the nice thing about RSS feeds is that though it's optional, a lot of them, and I think Google's in particular, has this GUID, which is supposed to represent unique ID, which is useful if you maybe want to do something like filtering out duplicates. You can check if you're getting multiple feeds from 02138 and 02 something else from the Boston area. You can at least check for duplicates. All right, and then there's descriptions and other stuff, but we'll leave that to your own creativity. So how can we go about creating a map that effectively does something like this? Uh, real maps.google.com, but our vision for this project, much like the Nintendo Wii, is that there should be a map that sort of grows to fill the screen, depending on how big the window is, at least one form field, the text field, where you can type a zip code, like 02138, hit enter. The page itself does not reload, but suddenly this map should scroll to that part of the world, assuming it's a valid zip code, and then sprinkle some mark one or more markers on the area if there's one or more news articles from that particular area. But if the user zooms out, you're going to need to figure out mm, just what cities or states are actually within view of this particular area. Now, fortunately, if I'm zoomed out to this point, let's scroll over to Massachusetts. So right now, I'm sort of within range of Connecticut, Massachusetts, most of New England, all of New England here, some of Pennsylvania, even Maryland down there. So how do you figure out all the zip codes in this area? Well, you know that 02138 is here. And it turns out that among Google's API docs, there are functions like, tell me the latitude, longitude coordinate of the boxes, current uh, top left corner. Tell me the same about the bottom right corner. That's potentially useful because it sort of bounds your world there. Unfortunately, it's not all that obvious how you would search Google News for news articles from a specific GPS coordinate, which is not really how they operate. They use zip codes. So how do you find out all of the zip codes within this area? Well, a useful thing, too, is that Google will tell you not only the GPS locations, but they'll tell you, for instance, how wide this window is in meters. So you can sort of figure out the size of the area. And now we're sort of talking store locator type features, right? If you go to uh, target.com and you want to find stores that stock the Nintendo Wii within 20 miles, well, you typically provide your zip code and the number 20 and then hit enter. And somehow they're searching a 20 mile radius. It's not perfect. It's not square. So it's not quite a perfect idea of rate. Uh, uh, quite consistent with the idea of a rectangle becoming a radius, but it's pretty close. So one of the things we've provided you with in project uh, three is 
a big old file that contains, I think, 42,000 zip codes from the United States along with their latitude and longitude coordinates. Uh, we must, we owe, oh, we paid $5 for this data, mind you. Uh, it's, it's legit for us to share it with you, so we're amortizing the cost over 160 some odd students total, um, distant and local alike, and we took the liberty of taking what was effectively an Excel file and a CSV file and just converting one of them into a MySQL table so that you, by way of pasting this really into MySQL prompt or PHP MyAdmin, will suddenly have a table called zip codes that has uh, zip codes and latitude and longitude and the town's names and the states and the uh, abbreviations thereof. So now you have a data set that gives you latitude, longitude, and zip codes. Well, it turns out you now have the ability with the right mathematics of figuring out one and a result set of zip codes near it, thereby giving you enough information to ask who or more. Google News. Right? Google News only takes zip codes, but Google Maps only gives you latitude, longitude. So this data set is really the bridge between the two, which suggests that if this is local on your web server, herein lies some of the Ajax. If I want to find news articles within that box, if I'm particularly zoomed out, I'm going to have to communicate back with CS75.net or your local boxes, ask a query like, give me more zip codes in that are within this box so that your same backend code can go make another HTTP call, not AJAX, but an HTTP call for what? One RSS feed per zip code. Now, if you get back a lot of zip codes here too, there's going to be some judgment calls. You don't want to go asking Google for 42,000 RSS feeds so you can put 42,000 markers. So the spec uh, explains that don't do that. Right? Be reasonable, speckle the things, don't overwhelm the map, and use your judgment how to do that. But how do you go about finding um, zip codes that are proximal to another, well, you'll see in the PDF out from tonight that thankfully this is one of those things that someone else has sort of done the hard thinking for us. And what we've provided to you in the spec, which you can copy and paste or just um, copy paste from the actual URL that we took this from, this is a MySQL function uh, called, in this case, get distance which in similar, similar in spirit to the count function and the sum function and the subtract function that come built into MySQL, when you paste this into your database and execute this query, this teaches MySQL about a new function called getDistance, which apparently expects a couple of values, um, latitude 1, longitude 1, latitude 2, longitude 2, and what tells you is the number of miles between those two points. Now that's not directly useful yet, but it's a useful building block for this, which is called a stored procedure, to come full circle to a, a question we opened with tonight. So a stored procedure in MySQL is a set of queries, selects, inserts, deletes, all of that kind of stuff, that you want to ep um, execute all together, one after the other, maybe with some added logic, but you don't want to have to have like a dozen PHP lines of code doing this for you. You'd much rather the database, ideally more efficiently than you could, just execute all this stuff together. So this uh, procedure that this same fellow from uh, the interweb wrote for us defines a procedure called get nearby zip codes that expects two arguments. One of our char called zip base, which is like 02138, and the second is a number that is the number of miles within which you want to find other zip codes. And so if you, again, paste this into PHP MyAdmin or just paste it into the MySQL command line prompt, thereby defining this procedure for your Project 3 database, what you'll then be able to do at the command line, at PHP MyAdmin, within a MySQL query function call in PHP, you can literally call, not select foo from bar, but call nearby zip codes on quote unquote 02138 comma 100, and what this will return, just like a select statement would, is a result set with zero or more rows, each one of which contains a zip code. So it's pretty neat. So thanks to this data set and thanks to this fellow having sort of done all the thinking about how you compute the distance and the radius and all of this sort of stuff, you have the ability just to ask queries of what effectively is a black box. But we're also introducing now this notion of a stored procedure and function, which up until now, your own project's implementations. So how to go about doing this in the first place? So there's any number of ways to go about building this project. But what I thought might be helpful would be at least one um, 
trajectory that if you're completely unsure as to how to proceed, you might want to go on. So consider this version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so forth of project two, of project three, and ideally by 1.0, you'll have everything working together. But here are some steps that I think I personally would take along the way toward making this. So version 0.1, honestly, just make the damn map. Like make a web page on your own domain name or on your own box that's just an index.html page or something that embeds a Google map, probably full screen. You know, or e.g. copy google1.html from tonight. Okay, Simple. So you can check off version 0.1. All right, now things get a little um, interesting with just CSS and XHTML. Now, don't make the map fill the screen, but just give yourself some room for a form, somewhere where the user can type in a zip code. Maybe it's on the top, maybe it's on the left, wherever, but figure out now how to make sure that that form probably takes a fixed amount of space, or something like that, but the map itself grows depending on the user's browser window. Right? The goal is not to have the user scrolling up and down or left and right. The interface we expect is just like Google Maps, which fills the screen but grows to fill the screen, at least within reason. If you make it really tiny, I mean, the realist, we, we're reasonable. But if it's larger, it should grow to fill the screen. And without that little bugs that many of you will come across where you can scroll down and there's nothing actually there. So there's some interesting tricks you'll likely encounter there. But then at that point, you should have a form that does nothing but has a button and a text field and the map. All right, so that's version point two. So now let's begin to do something more interesting. In point three, why not define an onsubmit handler for that same form that calls some function that you're going to write that calls gmap2's set center function. So you've got a map object in memory just like all of our demos tonight. Call set center, but what are you going to call it on? Yeah, so you're somehow going to want to figure out how to convert the zip code to latitude and longitude so that you can pass that lat long to set center. Unfortunately, Google provides a service for that. So it does take, we typed in tonight, Cambridge Mass 02138. It'll also take 02138. So think of geocoding in that version 0.3. So now you have a mashup that um, frankly works pretty similar to our last Google 6.html example, except my kind of cheated and I just hard coded the size of the thing. So there's a little CSS and maybe JavaScript trickery there. In version 0.4, now it's time to start adding the markers and the info window. So it's probably, the, probably a reasonable next step would be plant a marker, maybe smack dab in the middle of that zip code. So Google is going to arbitrarily choose a lat longitude point for a zip code, which is probably roughly in the middle, so to speak, of the zip code, even though the things can be rather amorphous. So why not plant a stake in the ground at that latitude longitude point and attach a gInfo window to it that maybe just links somewhere, maybe to the web version, the HTML version of Google News. Just so again, you're taking a step toward a more interesting implementation. And now the magic begins to come in. So in version 0.5, you're halfway there, you need to probably integrate a bit of Ajax. So when I click the go button, so to speak, on your page, no longer are you just going to query the geocoder service and then call set center. What else has to happen there too? If the next step is to go grab the relevant RSS for that zip code. Yeah, so not only are you going to have to call the geocoder service, which again is asynchronous, so you can call it, give it a handler, and then keep going about your business. Well, what business do you need to conduct? You need to yourself make an Ajax call, maybe with Yahoo's library. Google actually provides a browser independent Ajax library, or just roll it yourself, so to speak, by hard coding in the kinds of code we looked at last week um, for the XML HTTP request object itself. Either way, pull your own foo.php file on your server, that probably has a call like what to go get an RSS feed? Fget, there's an even easier one. Uh, even better than fopen. File get contents, as I recall, can take not only a file name, but also a whole URL. So if you want to go get the contents of a web page, aka XML file, just call file get contents, and it's going to return to you a really long string, which you can then pass to given that this is XML, you can pass to like the uh, simple XML elements constructor. Now you have back a DOM in memory, but you can actually cheat, right? You have in JavaScript DOM functions. So in theory, you could just use your PHP file as a proxy, which when queried goes and gets the appropriate RSS feed based on the URL for Google News that returns RSS, which you can figure out just by viewing the source of the page or the address bar. You could just grab that string of XML and then do what with it? 
you know, why not just give it back to, as the response to the AJAX call, right? AJAX can return XML. You just queried Google for XML, which is RSS. Why not just give yourself that XML? Now, granted, now you have to start jumping through some hoops in that you have to use JavaScript's DOM functions to navigate the RSS. Doable. Frankly, I think you'll find PHP's simple XML API much nicer. You can use XPath and you can cast things to strings. You don't have to use children and such. It's up to you, though, but just realize the design options here. But whatever you choose, ultimately, you're probably going to pass back to your JavaScript at least some titles and some URLs of the news articles and questions. Maybe doing some filtrations. So you're not returning uh, duplicates or you're not returning all 42,000 articles, maybe, for the current month. Then you're going to pass that back to your JavaScript. And what are you going to do? Well, maybe you should just tweak that marker rather than to have it be a hard-coded URL. Why not give us 10 URLs to the most recent 10 articles from 02138 or anything like that? It's not the end game. It's just a step. All right, now at that point in the story, you've kind of got your mashup, right? You've got news integrated into maps. The only thing you haven't really handled is the zooming problem, right? What if I start zooming out so I can see Cambridge and Boston and Springfield and New England? Now that AJAX query has to be a little smarter. So the AJAX query, yes, has to ask Google for 02138. But it's also got to ask for what? The whole, the whole region. Now, or some subset of the region. So if you use that fellow's stored procedure and get back 100 zip codes, probably not very reasonable or wise to just ask Google for 100 different feeds. Maybe we suggest in the spec use some pseudo randomness, maybe do some kind of magic, but just get a subset of articles back. Pass that back now not, uh, to your JavaScript file, using, having used that $5 table, and now integrate more markers, perhaps. Now, you might have to use the geocoder service at this point in the story multiple times so that you can have a marker for 02138 and Springfield, Massachusetts. Not for all the zips, but you're going to have to exercise some judgment there. And then finally, or I'm sure you'll find other steps here and maybe in between these, but you can start listening for the move end event on the map or the zoom end event on the map. Because any time either of those is triggered, what's got to happen? All of that, again, right? Because you're going to have to either put more markers on the screen or take some away. So at the end of the day, it's actually, frankly, I love this assignment and I love this particular project. For one, it ties together pretty much all the preceding projects in that we now have XML coming full circle, being in a very real world useful sense, because this is how much data is syndicated. We've got our PHP, we've got our MySQL, we now have our AJAX, and now we have other publicly available APIs being mashed together. This sort of does represent um, a truly dynamic website. So hopefully this will serve as some motivation for your own projects as you come to them. In fact, one announcement before this question, besides project 3 spec, notice that the final project spec is also out. And perhaps the neatest thing about this spec and its requirements, and look at the requirements, right? So few requirements. It's really meant to be an open-ended project which you should choose something that excites you, something that interests you. We'll be fairly open-minded if you'd like to sort of kill two birds with one stone and work on a project that you'd like to for your real job that might mesh well with the course so long as you're applying some of the lessons from the course. Um, the first phase of this project is a pre-proposal to your teaching fellow, which is really an opportunity in a week's time to just bounce ideas off of your TF. I'm kind of thinking this, I'm kind of thinking that. It's sort of our way of helping you help you get started. The proposal itself is due a couple of weeks later in mid-April, followed by a status report in early May, followed by the implementation itself in late May. So it's meant to be a, a multi-level process, but you still have a couple of months to, to make all of that happen. Yeah? I will. I'm going to link to the Shuttleboy JavaScript file on the website since it sort of is a good um, stepping stone toward this stuff. Second question. Uh, when we get the RSS feed back, mm -hmm. can't we just parse it there with the XPath function? Yes. The yes. And take out the necessary fields and pass them on as JSON object to? Yes. Yes. So to summarize for the camera, yes, you can do all your parsing of the RSS file in your PHP code and then only send what data you want to the JavaScript file. I'll defer to the spec, and the spec suggests uh, pseudo randomness or clever heuristics. <laughs> it's meant to be, I mean, it's, act, it's a real sort of world design question. How do you do it without querying for you know, thousands of um, zip codes? So we'll leave it to you to figure out the best way.
But there's going to be interesting issues, right? If you do pseudo randomness, you might get good spread, but you also might get a cluster of news articles only for the top right hand quadrant of the US. And now there's no news apparently happening here. But again, Geo Google's geocoder service does map. Um, zip codes to latitude longitude you can find out the boundaries of your box so your pseudo randomness can actually be made more intelligent by being sort of a pseudo randomness from different quadrants perhaps and something like that so there's some interesting opportunities here and no one right answer i think so with that said get to it we'll see you in a week